The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, came forward and put this question to Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, If someone's brother dies leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman but died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And likewise, all the seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. Now at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, the children of this age marry and remarry, but those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like angels, and they are the children of God, because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush, when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he is not God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. The Gospel of the Lord. How could this have happened? Now that's the question that we have to ask having read the first passage from the second book of Maccabees. First, a little history. In the year 333 before our Lord, B.C., Alexander the Great began his conquests. So he moves from Greece, conquers Asia Minor, and then down to Syria, conquering the Holy Land, conquering Egypt, moving to Persia, conquering that, and eventually Alexander the Great will even enter India, and then he'll die shortly thereafter. About 175, now that Alexander had been dead, his kingdom divided among different successors, the Seleucids, who took control of Syria, now also took control of the Holy Land. King Antiochus Epiphanes IV decided, we're all going to be alike. We're going to have like a secular Hellenistic Greek culture. So he forbade Judaism. So now all of Israel was forbidden to practice their faith. They were forbidden to offer the different rituals, celebrate the different feast days. Now, the, all the Torah scrolls that could be found, other sacred writings were burnt. People had to become really secular if a good Jewish couple wanted to have their baby boy circumcised in accord with the covenant law. They would be crucified and the baby would be hung around the mother's neck. Antiochus even profaned, desecrated the holy temple. In the big courtyard, he set up brothels, men, women, children, you name it, you could do it. On the holy altar where sacrifices were offered to God, he set up a statue of Zeus. And on that altar, he offered pigs, the forbidden animal to the Jews. He looted the temple, desecrated the sacred vessels, and so on. One has to ask, how could this have happened? Worse yet, we read in 2 Maccabees, all of the Gentiles conformed to the command of the king, and many Israelites were in favor of his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. Notice that, not a few Israelites, many Israelites. What had they forgotten? Had they forgotten the covenant that God had made with them? Had they forgotten the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of Moses? How could they just apostatize like this, like nothing ever happened? Perhaps the problem was the issue of faith. Faith had become something of just a superficial faith, 
not something deep-rooted in one's soul. The practice of faith just became sort of customary, something traditional rather than something of living worship. Their kingdom became a kingdom of here and now, built on wealth, honors, power, instead of living in God's kingdom, in his covenant. So that's how it really happened that so many could so easily give up their faith and turn to this paganism. However, many remained faithful. And that's the importance of our first passage. Here we have a mother and her seven sons. They refuse to give in. They refuse to swallow the lies, not just the pork, but swallow the lies. Gradually, from the oldest to the youngest son, in the eyes of the mom, they're put to torture and eventually death. Each one's given the opportunity to apostatize. They refuse. So they're scourged, scalped, hands and feet cut off, the tongues cut out, and then roasted alive. Imagine that. It's incredible. What would it be like to be that mother and watch your children go through such torture? But what does the mother say when the youngest child comes to the judgment? She says, son, have pity on me who carried you in my womb for nine months, nursed you for three years, brought you up, educated and supported you to your present age. I beg you, child, do not be afraid of this executioner, but be worthy of your brothers and accept death, so that in the time of mercy I may receive you again with them. Here is a faith that believed in a living God, a faith that believed in a better world than just this one, a faith that knew we'd have to account for our lives. So they had no fear. I'm sure, yes, it was not easy. By God's grace, they faced the executioners. But they did not fear death. They had the hope of everlasting life. Well, my brothers and sisters, shouldn't we even have a greater faith? Shouldn't we have a stronger hope because of Jesus? Consider that Christ came to renew that covenant that had been made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to renew the covenant made with Moses. Christ came, true God, who also became true man in the incarnation, to perfectly reveal God's truth, God's way, to perfectly share God's life with us. He went to that cross to offer the sacrifice for our sins and rose to give us the hope of everlasting life. So the kingdom we live in is Christ's kingdom, not the kingdom of this world. Moreover, Christ ascended, and therefore he opened the gates of heaven and prepared a place for us. Remember that. Always have your hope set on being with our Lord and all the angels and saints in heaven. At the Last Supper, Jesus said to his apostles, do not let your hearts be troubled. Have faith, for in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and I've prepared a place for you, and I will come back to take you with me so that where I am, you also may be. How beautiful this is, but we have to believe it, because just like those Old Testament Jews during the time of the Maccabees, it would be so easy to have simply that cultural faith, just something of rituals, traditions, a superficial faith, a faith that's really just in this world, this kingdom, and accumulating the power, the riches, the material things. No, we have to have a strong faith. And that's the witness of our early church. Now, in the early church, of course, we're under persecution by the Roman Empire for three centuries. The testimony of so many martyrs is just like that mother in Maccabees. So many martyrs who were willing to face incredible, unimaginable tortures at the hands of the Romans rather than sacrifice to the gods, 
rather than to sacrifice to Peter. But why could they do that? They knew Christ had risen, and so death had no consequence for them. Death was simply a passing. Their heart was set on a greater kingdom. But we have to always ask ourselves, how strong is our faith? As we go past, then, the persecution during the Roman Empire, and we enter into that period called Christendom, when all of Europe is of one faith, one church, think of one of the, one of the situations that happened. How could it be in 1534, Henry VIII on his own could say, I'm the head of the church, and everyone so many fell into line. Oh, yes, Henry. And they severed themselves from the rest of the church and eventually gave up so much of the Catholic faith. Yet there were the faithful, good, faithful families and good, faithful individuals. Thomas More, a nobleman, the only one who defied Henry. And before the ax fell, he said, I'm the king's good servant but God's first. St. John Fisher, the only bishop to defy Henry. What's wrong with that scenario? The only bishop to denounce Henry's action. He too died a martyr. And so many others would die martyrs. And the church would go underground for three centuries until finally Parliament allowed a toleration of Catholicism. Or what about Catholic France? How could it be in 1789 in a French revolution that proclaimed liberty, equality, fraternity, and so on, tried to wipe out the church? The French Revolution, so many who had been raised Catholics, turned in this vehemence against the church. They erected a statue of the goddess of reason in Notre Dame Cathedral. So many. Faithful Catholics were put to the test and given the choice, die or live in this world. For instance, we have a whole Carmelite convent of sisters that was marched in procession to the guillotine. And as they were marched, they sang the Te Deum and they said, in you, Lord, is our hope and we shall never hope in vain, one by one, the guillotine fell. Or St. John Vianney was raised as a child in a family that kept the faith and lived in an underground church community. Yes, so many people kept the faith, while yet so many were willing to apostatize. Or even think in more recent times how in Catholic Mexico in the 1920s, Catholic Spain in the 1930s, communists could take control and start a massive persecution of the church where literally thousands of priests, religious brothers and sisters were executed, churches burned, convents closed, and yet people kept the faith. There's always the faithful remnant. There are those that have that superficial faith, but those to keep the faith. Where do we stand? That's the real key here. As we're growing to the end of our liturgical year and we're coming to the conclusion of this year of faith, which should have been a time of renewal, we do have to ask ourselves, what about me? If I lived in those circumstances, not an easy question, makes me tremble. We'd have to hope by God's grace we could be strong. Now, some might say, well, that, Father, that's not going to happen here. We're in America. We have religious freedom. Don't count on it. It can change quickly, just as we've seen in history. For instance, in my time of life, I have seen in the 1960s how a Supreme Court could say, you can't pray in public schools anymore. You can't read the Bible in public schools. Don't we all well know? living here in Loudoun County, how there's a fight every Christmas over a nativity scene at the courthouse in Leesburg, a fight over the nativity scene. And if you want a nativity scene for Christmas, you have to have the Hanukkah thing, you have to have Santa Claus, and even the atheists have to do their thing. What about that? Or 
think about our government. We had a shutdown, remember? Did any of you hear that because of that shutdown, Catholic priests who were not official chaplains, but Catholic priests who served the faithful Catholics on military bases, so our armed services personnel, were not allowed to step foot on that base. The chapels were closed, sacraments were forbidden because of the shutdown. One Catholic priest had mass in a park outside the base. Did any of us hear that? That's persecution. Or do we know that the federal government, Department of Education, wants us to swallow something called the Common Core Curriculum, and they want us to swallow their tax money aid and so on, but this curriculum in fourth grade has a nice program where every deviant lifestyle is presented as normal. Or in sixth grade world history, a whole 32-page chapter is devoted to Islam and Christianity gets a footnote. That's indoctrination. Do we know what's going on? And when does this so-called secular culture that's so tolerant say, we won't tolerate you for your faith? What would we do then? Would we be here? What would we do then? Would we be here? Well, my brothers and sisters, the answer is we have to be strong. Inspired by this example of this mother in Maccabees and her seven sons, you and I have to have a strong faith, a real living faith. It can't be cultural. It can't be superficial. It can't just be little pious actions. No, an absolute firm faith that Christ is our Lord and Savior. Billy Graham this week turned 95 and he gave an interview on Fox News and he said, America needs a spiritual awakening. Absolutely. But that awakening takes us. You and I have to be the strong, faith-filled members, no matter what those in control may say. Our Lord is Christ. We follow him. We live in our church. We live our faith. What this means, though, is it's not just here. It's in your homes. St. Paul, talking to those Thessalonians of the early church, would say to us, encourage your children. Pray for your children so you parents really create a home that is filled with Christ, where he's the Lord and Savior. Teach your children the faith. Give them that Catholic identity. Have those good Catholic devotions so that your children know that beyond anything else in this world, they're Catholics, they're Christians, they love Christ. I've seen this in my life as a priest. I've been very blessed to see so many faith-filled families, including here. Look around, this gives us hope. You all are here to worship God, priority number one. This gives us hope. But yesterday, for instance, I had a wedding of a young man who I've known since the year 2000 when our parish started, and a good Catholic young man who found a good Catholic girl. Both had wonderful Catholic parents, grandparents, and so on. What great hope that is. Not a wedding that's just a show, but a wedding that was a real sacrament, a real privilege, a joy to celebrate that wedding. Well, that's what we need. That's what we need in our world. And you are the ones that have to give that because it's about Christ. So my brothers and sisters, we are challenged as we're drawing to a close of this liturgical year, coming to the end of the year of faith, let us ask ourselves, am I doing the best I can to live the faith? Am I doing the best for my kids to make a home that's really a Christian home? It's always good to pause and rethink, but in so doing, make a real commitment, a renewed commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ. For only in him do we find real life. Only in him do we have hope. May God bless you.